Hi everybody, it's Susie Murr and I am here for The Daily Space today, January 13th, 2013. I am here to put science in your brain. So everybody give me a thumbs up in the chat if you see and hear me and if things look okay and we will get started. And once again, I apologize because I have to read my script from my iPad, so it means I look down a lot. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so I have not quite mastered the, the having a uh, teleprompter up here because I only have one <laughs> monitor. And I have all the OBS stuff going up here. Um, but I look down to read. And Hopefully today I will remember to use my slides because Friday I completely forgot to use my slides. Yeah, we're having fun doing streaming. I hope y'all don't mind. Thank you. It's a learning curve. I hope you're enjoying it. But I have already read through this because I recorded the podcast just a little bit ago. So at least I now can stumble through uh, the script. So all right, if y'all are ready to get started, it's Monday. And for many of us, this is the first normal week of the year. Kids are returning to college, astronomers are returning home from AAS, and TV shows are returning from hiatus. So as we try to figure out what normal is going to look like from 20, for 2020, we here at The Daily Space want to remind you, the new normal does not include aliens. No, just no, not aliens. It's not aliens. This week, we were a bit confused and disturbed to see reports on fast radio bursts that implied that these bursts were some kind of radio signal that SETI has been looking for. No. Last week, there was a series of press releases that came out during the American Astronomical Society meeting, including one very specific fast radio burst. And this one's fun. I'm going to na name it for you. FRB 180916.J0158 plus 65. Yeah, that's a name. Don't let astronomers name things. Uh, and its location in a not too distant spiral galaxy. At the time, we didn't cover the story because there really wasn't a lot to cover. Fast radio bursts are. Sorry, I changed the slide, lost my place. Fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are millisecond long bursts of radio emissions that appear both as singular bursts and repeating bursts. The first FRB was discovered in archival data in 2007, and in the years since, attempts to discover the source of these bursts have been full of confusion. While, ar while archival searches have found bursts, observing them on purpose has been very hard. In 2010, 16 FRBs were detected by Parkes Radio Telescope, and they were found to be of terrestrial origin and were associated with standard kitchen microwave ovens. While this led to some discussion that microwave ovens might be the so source of all FRBs, the detection of a repeating FRB in 2012 quelled that line of thinking. That object, FRB 121102, has a highly variable pattern of bursts. It appears to be associated with, or at least aligned with, this, aligned in the sky with, a dwarf galaxy about three billion light years away from Earth. And what the source is, well, the literature is a mess, but most guesses point to some sort of compact object, like a neutron star or a black hole, having a strong magnetic field that's interacting with it somehow. This kind of vague and inconclusive kind of observation is the norm for FRBs. And when a series of new releases came out last week, we looked at the science and decided to pass on these releases in favor of other more definitive news. So last week, a consortium of institutions announced that another repeating FRB had been identified in a location in the sky. And this time the alignment was, was, a, was with a star forming galaxy a star forming region in a spiral galaxy. This region is sufficiently different from past observations to make the science about FRBs even more confusing. According to team member Kenzie Nimmo of the University of Amsterdam, the found location is radically different from previously located repeating FRBs, but also different from all previously studied FRBs. 
So the difference between repeating and non-repeating fast radio bursts are thus even less clear. And we think these events may not be linked to a particular type of galaxy or environment. It may be that FRBs are just produced in a large zoo of locations across the universe and just require some very specific conditions to be visible. So in other words, we have little idea what FRBs are, what the, and they could be a whole lot of different things. After all, we already know some are signals from other galaxies, and some are Australian microwave ovens. When there's a gap in understanding, it's possible for people to guess at solutions and in the case of FRBs, some have guessed that these signals are digitized shouts from alien civilizations. Either pulsed communications we just can't understand, or just a burst of energy meant to say, hey, we're here. While there's a non-zero chance one or some of the bursts can be explained this way, a non-zero possibility and a likely possibility are not the same thing. And what we're seeing are the recurring bursts appear to be too energetic to be rationally created artificially. Unless your way of forming things artificially includes the ability to alter the behavior of stars and the materials falling into compact objects. That's a tall order. So, to the headlines claiming astronomers have found radio signals that SETI has been looking for? No, not really. This is not definitive evidence of aliens or actually definitive news of anything whatsoever. This is news that we have now, for the second time, figured out where on the sky a weird signal is coming from. And that's it. That's all we know. A location, but not even a certain distance. So the universe is full of weird stuff. Hopefully some of that weird stuff is also biological. When and if we do find it, its evidence will need to be extraordinary. And if it happens in our careers, we promise to explain that evidence to you here on The Daily Space. In other news, we have an update on where to look for life from the Goldilocks Project. Led by Ed Guinan and Scott Engel, this Villanova project, this Villanova University project, is working to define where life is most likely to exist. And by the numbers, the answer appears to be around K-stars. Slightly cooler than our sun, and a lot more common, these orange stars don't go through as prolonged a period of violence as red dwarf stars. And because they are larger, they have a larger habitable zone. With the inner edge of these habitable regions much farther from the surface of these less violent stars, this team finds planets would get about one one hundredth of as much deadly radiation as similar worlds around active M dwarfs. So, if you want to rationally look for life, go look around K dwarfs, not fast radio bursts. In talking about habitable zones, we are generally referring to the regions around stars where liquid water can exist on the surface of a planet because it receives enough light from the star to melt ice, but not so much that the water evaporates away. As we look around our solar system, we're realizing that physics and geology have teamed up to create liquid water in many other ways. 410 years ago, today, Galileo discovered the moon Ganymede orbiting Jupiter. This giant moon is larger than Mercury and has a rocky looking surface and probably a nickel iron core that is responsible for its strong magnetic field. Between the surface and the core is where things get interesting. Based on a variety of different kinds of observations, it appears that Ganymede has a subsurface ocean that is heated by the constant flexing and stretching the world experiences as it interacts gravitationally with the other Galilean moons. These oceans may be the largest in our solar system. They may be in depths of up to 800 kilometers. If there's life in these oceans, we have no way to discover it, at least not right now. And this is a reminder that life may exist in all sorts of places where we can't remotely detect it. And all these discussions of Goldilocks zones only apply to surface life, like us. And we have no way of knowing what kind of life, if any, 
is common out there among the stars. Okay, folks, that wraps, our, wraps up our show. So now I will flip over to the chat and I will remember to click all the buttons so you can see the chat. And you guys let me know if y'all have questions over here. And I'm hoping, I know Annie is in the chat. I'm hoping maybe Dr. Pamela is in the chat. She was having a bit of a debate on a phone call this morning. So hopefully she is back in here and maybe is here to answer some of our questions. Thank you, Bad Panda Bear, for the subscription. We appreciate that so much. Everybody give cheers for that. Or give, put in a few emotes. There we go. So, all right, let me go back and see. Do I see questions? I see some. Scroll back, the chat talks, the chat moves quick. So apologies if I miss anything. I know I'm not perfect at that yet. It hops very quickly. FRBs, this is from RefsMat. FRBs are produced, crap, it jumped. FRBs are produced in a large zoo across the universe, like a galaxy zoo? Maybe, maybe, but we like this one a little better. All right, Larry Weird says, but maybe Furbies are starships with Alcubierre drives slowing down. Can this be ruled out? Uh, so if an FRB is a ship with an Alcubierre drive. Yeah, and I like that, uh, that nickname, Furbies. Took me a second to get it, but I got it. Um, I'm sure it could be. It's just not terribly likely because I don't think anyone has really done the Alcubierre drive uh, and you know had it working out in practical situations just yet. I know I think they were testing them. Um, I think it, it's largely theoretical, but I think maybe they were trying to test some of that. Once again, producer, not scientist. So. That is definitely one of those things to bug Dr. Pamela about. And Dr. Pamela will be back tomorrow here on the Daily Space. So definitely come in with all of these questions for her because I just know what I read a lot in press releases and kind of absorb from osmosis being around all of this stuff, which is not insignificant, but I'm not the scientist. That's Dr. Pamela. And also, I don't know that much about rockets, so that's an Amy thing or a Dave thing here in chat, or in Stro. And Dave says, also, if you're pointed at a life-bearing planet when you come out of warp, you'll sterilize said planet. So, yeah, you don't want to stop your light speed ship right in front of your destination. Haney is right. Yeah, Annie knows enough to be dangerous. Me too. I have a little bit of knowledge across a lot of things, so I know enough to be dangerous and good at trivia. That's pretty much it. Uh, trivia is one of my superpowers. I remember stuff and I don't remember where I know it from. Um, Astro West says, I've never heard of FRBs referred to as Furbies before, and I won't be starting it now. Yeah, Furbies. Yeah, that, that one, I don't know. We'll see what, we'll see what Pamela uses. Our intro says, Annie knows enough to cause problems in line at Disney World. Yes, we did cause problems in line at Disney World and it was hilarious. And Annie gives us a report. There are still four toilets in space. Yes, Crew Dragon has a toilet. Which is a good thing because, you know, it takes a few hours to get up to the space station. So, uh, yeah, you want it to be a, you want it to have a toilet. And I expect it to be a nice one in the Crew Dragon, you know, a nice one. Planetary Pan says, I don't want Furbies to become a thing, please. Okay, so we will call them FRBs. I will go with that. Haney's Warwarp says, maybe you could be the expert of the psychology of long space journeys. I would be interested in working on that. I, I find the psychology of traveling into space fascinating because it is definitely a challenge humans have never had to face before. I mean, the closest we have are the people being up in the space station for a year. 
Um, but to be that far away from Earth, like traveling to Mars or something, that is a whole new set of stresses and complications. And I don't even know where you begin to figure out what kind of people to put together and do that. They got to be tough as nails. That's pretty much the main thing. Because, you know, in the space station, if they have to, they have Soyuz capsules that they can hop in, hop in and be back on Earth within a day or two days. You know, it, it's not long. They can escape, basically. Um, but if you're on a ship, like, headed to Mars, there's no escape. You're stuck. And if you get on there and, you know, people will lie to be able to do things they want to do. So you have to deal with the fact that through all the training and all the preparation, you may have someone who is sufficiently good enough to lie their way through. And you may get some doozies out there. Okay, let's see. Larry Weird says, we need to quit sending people to the ISS for more than two or three months. Stop it, it hurts them. It does appear to hurt them. Unfortunately, the only way we're gonna figure out how to not hurt them is to send people up there and try it. And this is one of the problems, and this is also one of the issues with doing research on humans. They have to be willing, they have to understand what's going on with them. This is called informed consent. And, you know, Scott Kelly, he gave informed consent to do the, to do the year study going into space. And unfortunately, he is having negative symptoms afterwards. But all you can do is try to prepare people as much as possible before and make sure they completely know what they're getting into as much as anybody can before they do that. But we're not going to be able to go to space without some people doing some research. So the best we can do is they volunteer. Um, just like anything else with research, some of it you've got to do. So the best you can do is just try to be as ethical as possible doing it and try not to let them hurt themselves too much. And I bet if you ask Scott Kelly now, he would still do it, even though it's not been pleasant because there's, there are people out there in the world who believe that the knowledge that is gained is more important than what happens to them as an individual. And those people forward knowledge for all of us. And this is just me thinking, speaking off the top of my head personally as a person with a background in psychology and just a human. Um, there are people out there who are willing to do things like this so that we all learn that make things better for everyone else. There'll be a lot of this research that will apply to taking care of health conditions here on Earth as well. So there is long-term good being done. It's just hard when you see someone like that go up to space and then come back with health problems that you know they wouldn't have had if they had stayed on Earth. That is difficult. Um, it's a challenge. And progress is not always easy. Um, best we can do is try to keep it as ethical as possible and take as good a care of them as we can and figure things out quickly so we can take care of our, our astronauts and our explorers. And welcome to my TED Talk. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Larry says we need to have a rotational space station. Yes. I do agree with that. I agree we've got to find ways to reduce the harm as quickly as possible. And I do believe that there is, uh, you know, having at least, you know, a third G would probably make a huge difference. Uh, if you've watched the... The Expanse, the TV show, you know, just having a little bit of gravity and rotation makes it so much easier to take care of a body because normal things like healing from injuries and stuff don't work properly in zero G. They did a great job of demonstrating that. And so, yeah, I agree that we need to get something up there rotating because we need to be able to test that quickly. And no, I don't want people to get harmed. I don't want them to get harmed. I definitely don't want them to get harmed excessively. And I don't want anybody volunteering for something that's going to be bad at them. But I also recognize some people are going to volunteer anyway. And some of them are pretty awesome people who are willing to do it for everyone else. It's a tough subject. 
I mean, you, this is all ethics and you've got to be thoughtful and caring and considerate of those people and just do the best you can and take as good a care of them as possible and try to figure out things as fast as possible so people don't get hurt. That is the very best thing we can do. Um, let's see. I've read the worst mission duration is one month because you don't completely adapt to micro G, but you get a lot of the negative effects coming back to Earth. That's from Kerbal Wine. Yeah, that probably sounds the most rough because you've you've gotten up there, you've not quite gotten acclimated to the situation, but yeah, you're coming home with some problems. All right, let's see. Our instructor says, anyone with a top-loading washing machine can tell you what happens when things get out of balance. Oh yeah, this is why I have a side spinner washing machine, and it's also more efficient with water. Um, but yeah, yeah, spin the drum, spin the drum in Haney's Warwick. That's what they did in the Expanse, and it saved a lot of people to be able to spin up. Um, and Planetary Pan's recommending a book here. The Calculating Stars in the Faded Sky by Mary Cole Robinette, who is a very good author, by the way. I've not read that one, but I will put it in my list of things, <laughs> in my stack of books to read that I have not yet gotten to read. That's pretty good. Two books, by the way. Two books from it. I'm guessing it's a series. I know uh, Mary Cole Robinette does a lot of things. Let's see, am I missing any questions from before I got on my soapbox and did my little TED talk here? Annie, are you covering the Ariane launch on the 16th? You can let us know about that. And no, Larry, nobody wants to torture astronauts, or at least none of us here want to torture astronauts at all. We want to figure this stuff out as fast as possible so people are not harmed. Um, unfortunately, it's the bleeding, edge of, the bleeding edge of research. Sometimes things get harmed. Definitely want to figure things out as fast as possible. Um, I sympathize, Larry, though. It is a di very difficult subject to talk about. And yeah, humans are not Kerbals. We can't just throw them in space and then go back and catch them later. Yeah, the little Kerbals in Kerbal Space Program, you can leave them floating out in space for ages and they're fine. No, humans are not that. Um, definitely not that. Let me mute real quick. My son just came in. I'm going to tell him I'm streaming. Just in case he forgets when he comes in. Um, yeah, a Kerbal can survive atmospheric re-entry from Earth. Yes, humans are not Kerbals. Um, I feel bad about the Kerbals. So about the Ariane launch, so apparently it's on Thursday. So Annie says it depends. Thursday she doesn't usually stream and she may already have plans. So we can ask Dr. Pamela if maybe she's going to stream that. Or... We might see if I could do something like that. I think I have dinner plans on Thursday already, too. I think we're starting a trivia league. And so uh, the RN launch may not get covered, but we'll see. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, you can't interfere with my social life. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I only work part-time here. Uh, no. <laughs> we'll see if we can get that one covered for everybody. Our instra says a human can survive reentry too. You just need to put them in the right kind of bag with the right kind of shielding. This is very true. Yeah. I'm sorry I would opened up the can of worms about human studying and testing, but we really want to find out how to protect our astronauts as, find, as fast as possible. And science is hard, and space is hard, and there's a lot of things that we're going to learn by trial and error, unfortunately. Larry Weird says, the Gateway Foundation makes the case that Starship needs to have people stay at Von Braun Station while the Starship is refueled. 
No one refueled a rocket with a human in it. Both. Sorry, trying to parse that one. Basically, you don't want people in the rocket while it's being refueled. Got that. That makes sense. Veronica Kerr says she's glad we covered the fast radio burst signals. Oh, yeah. When Dr. Pamela sees something a little wacky in the space news, she's going to make sure we cover it. Um, she's going to make sure we knock that question right out, right off the bat. It's not aliens. Or it is extremely unlikely that it's aliens, and there's no way for me to know if, no way for us to know if it's aliens right now. So it could be in a microwave oven in Australia, so let's not get too excited about it. <laughs> it's okay, Larry. Sometimes, oh boy, if you saw all of my messages in Slack and Discord, you'd be like, I don't understand how you parse anything. Autocorrect makes me look like a moron sometimes. Veronica Kier says that story about aliens made it to BBC News. Well, yeah, everybody wanted some kind of encouraging news because regular news is bleh, terrible. So this at least was interesting, maybe slightly hopeful, definitely weird. Okay, well, if y'all don't have any other questions, I am going to go ahead and wrap this up and see if I can maybe roll credits. I don't know why my, my credits don't roll. I don't know. I add the credits in post. Basically, let me read my wall of text and tell you guys about it and give you all the bloops. And thank you. And then I will go on and finish editing the podcast. And then I will edit the video. And I will get everything up over on the blog post on dailyspace.org. So if you ever want to read the details, basically you're reading what Dr. Pamela gave us in the script with all the links and, and pictures and stuff put in it. Go over to dailyspace.org and you will see that. So I usually do that right after the show. I, I download the video first, edit that, get it uploading to YouTube because that takes time sometimes. And then I go in and do the podcast, the blog post, and then I post it over on Patreon for our folks there today. And then on Patreon, it goes public to everybody else tomorrow. So if you're on our Patreon, you get it hand delivered to you a day ahead. So if you want to join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. Well, all right. Thank you all for listening. The Daily Space is produced by me, Susie Murph, and it's a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 organization, 501c3 nonprofit dedicating to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to the generous support of people like you. And if you want to become a supporter, go visit us over at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. Every live episode of this show is archived over on YouTube. If you miss an episode on twitch.tv, you can find us over on youtube.com slash C slash CosmoQuest. And it'll be up just a, in a little while this afternoon. Just takes a little time to do the video editing and get it out for you. Well, all right. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Dr. Pamela will be here for you tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, I think we have a rocket roundup. Hopefully, Annie will be there. Uh, she wasn't feeling well this weekend, so we'll see. One of us will definitely cover the Rocket Roundup on Wednesday. And hopefully we'll be back to normal schedule this week. And maybe we'll even cover a rocket or two. I don't know. I'm not promising. But we'll try. Um, at some point, they'll teach me how to cover rocket launches. And I will be on talking about those too, I'm pretty sure. So we can tag team better. Because I'm finding I kind of like the streaming stuff kind of fun um, because talking is not a problem for me imagine that so you guys have a great day and don't forget wherever you are go outside and look up we'll talk to you soon bye bye <laughs>